Okay, let's continue with our lecture from two days ago. The last item that we had was that we had uh, this Fourier decomposition of the vector field for a massive spin one particle, and it contained as Fourier coefficients operators A mu of P. So these are four operators for each value of the momentum P, and uh, this equation needs to be satisfied as a consequence of the Proper equation of motion. And uh, it is a linear equation between those four operators, so you can eliminate one of the four in favor of the other three, as an example. And so the solution of this equation is what I want to discuss with you now. And that is also an um, important part of the next exercise sheet, which you can prepare until next week. So a useful way to deal with this equation is the following. Namely, the same as what we did with the Dirac equation, where we also had some linear equations between such operators, and we solved them by going to a basis of particular spinors, and here we will also go to a basis of certain four-vector objects. Namely, we write uh, these operators with a Lorentz index mu as the following sum over three terms, lambda equal one, two, three, so there are three terms in the sum, and each term has the structure epsilon mu of p comma lambda times a of p comma lambda. And that means that uh, these epsilons here, they are number valued for vectors, no operators inside, but only numbers. And those are three operators for each of the three values of lambda. So here there are now three independent operators and three four vectors with four components and they span a basis of the four vectors satisfying this equation. So these are three linearly independent um, four vectors. Actually, let me not call it four vectors, but four component uh, numerical quantities, and those are three operators. So, and now uh, we, the equation at the top is fulfilled if epsilon mu times p mu is equal to zero for all these lambdas. Okay. Then we get here three linearly independent solutions of this linear equation. And for each of the linearly uh, independent solution, we have one operator. And that in this way, we nicely write uh, the solution to the equation as uh, this linear combination where we isolate the three independent operators and multiply them with number valued four component quantities. And so uh, the rest of the lesson will be about how to choose these quantities, epsilon mu, wave functions, or polarization vectors, as they are called. So that is the task for each p uh, or p mu with p0 is equal, as usual, to the square root of p square vector plus m square. We need to define three such linearly independent uh, epsilon mu with p dot epsilon equal zero. So how should we choose those epsilons, these polarization vectors? Let us do it in a pedestrian way by starting from some simple examples and then progressing to the more and more general case. And uh, you can already have a look at the exercise sheet. This is directly in line with what we are doing here, uh, where you can do even more examples of a similar nature. Let us begin with the rest frame. 
So we have a massive particle, therefore there exists a rest frame and we can first choose a four momentum P mu, which is in the rest frame. That means the four vector P mu is this, m comma zero, so the spatial P is entirely zero. What could then be a choice of three different epsilon mu polarization vectors which are orthogonal to that vector? So the scalar product between epsilon and that should be zero. And uh, there are three linearly independent solutions. Which solutions are there? Who sees one? Yeah, two. As a epsilon zero must be zero, and then everything else can be whatever. Exactly. And then we could have a basis epsilon p comma one, epsilon p comma two, and epsilon p comma three. So lambda equal one, two, three, three different basis vectors. And so what is your suggestion? So For zero. And then it can be anything but A, B, C. A, B, C, but it's a, it's a basis vector. Mm -hmm. Three basis vectors could be, for example. Yeah, so for example this, and then this, and that. Okay, x, y, and z basis vectors. That would be a good choice, and that is our choice. So that is certainly a good choice, and uh, do we need to check explicitly that this is valid? No. That is obvious, right? The scalar product between each of them, and this is zero, because as you said exactly, as long as the zero component vanishes, the scalar product is zero. So that is a good basis, and it's also good because these three are orthogonal to each other, and they span, of course, the entire space. The entire space of solutions is spanned by those three basis vectors. They are each normalized, orthogonal to each other, and so on. So that is all good. So we can, for example, do some game and do some small calculations. For example, what is epsilon uh, one scalar product with some of the other ones. What is that? Yep. Okay. And what happens if you have here three? And what happens if you have here one? Really? Minus one. Exactly. And so in general, so this is uh, equal, you can express it in terms of this uh, metric tensor <coughs> between the two lambdas, if you have here lambda and lambda prime, then you can write this as G lambda lambda prime with plus or minus. Is it plus or minus G lambda lambda prime? It's equal to plus G lambda lambda prime. So if lambda is equal to lambda prime, then you get minus one. If lambda is different from lambda prime, you get zero. And as it is written on the exercise sheet, this is an awkward notation because lambda is not a Lorentz index. Nevertheless, we can numerically evaluate G lambda lambda prime, and it is useful to do that here because it can be used to express the result in a simple form. Okay. Let's go to a more complicated example. B, the particle moves. P is non-zero, but let's say P is parallel to the z-axis. How does a four vector look like where P is oriented along the z-axis? So you have here E comma zero, zero, P, Z, where E square minus pz square is equal to m square. So such a four vector. And then again, the question is, what is our choice for the basis? That is now, of course, a little bit less obvious. But again, we should write down three 
polarization vectors, each of which is orthogonal in four dimensions to that one. So what are some possible choices? Yeah? The first two should just stay the same. The first two should stay the same. Uh, they can stay the same, so let us keep them. Just uh, so that means that these two are orthogonal already in the three-dimensional um, space and the zero component vanishes. And so that is a very simple choice. No mixing between space and time components, just already orthogonal in the spatial part and the time component vanishes. Very good choice. And here we have to work now. <coughs> that should now be something which is in the best case orthogonal to these two, but also uh, orthogonal to that four momentum. Yeah? P Z zero zero E. Is that already good enough? Does that work? Can you check it? No. Right, but it is orthogonal. Does it satisfy its scalar product if zero? Yes, it does. We do not need to put any minus signs and so on. Right, so that works, and let us normalize it so that all the vectors are dimensionless, and a good normalization could be what? such that it also reduces to this one in a, some limit. Yeah. One over m squared. Does not sound so promising because then it's not a, but one over m. One over m sounds good. What happens in the limit? Which limit? For example, the limit where pz goes to zero, if pz goes to zero, then uh, that goes to zero and this goes to m. So in that limit, this goes to zero, 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 m divided by m. So in the appropriate limit, it reduces to this one. So that is a very good normalization. It's dimensionless and it has the right norm. So that is a good choice. And question, is such an equation again valid? Is it obvious? Probably is. I mean, they are constructed to be orthogonal, so obviously orthogonal. And uh, it's also normalized, so this is still valid. Let's go to the third case. Now we have a spatial momentum which is arbitrary. And so our four vector p mu is e comma p vector and we just know e square is equal to p vector square plus m square. We don't know anything else. And then we also have to make some choice of three epsilons. What could we choose? Possibly we need some intermediate step before we can write down a clever choice. But motivated by your statement on these first two here, there is something analogous that we could now do. Yeah? Probably all need to be normalized by one of them. Mm, they should definitely be dimensionless again and have some limits. That's right, so if we have components containing E and P, then definitely we should normalize with one over M, that's true. But what exactly should the components be? What should the components be? And uh, so obviously we have treated here this. Uh, the third one is a little bit different from the first two. And so again here it will happen that the third one will be a little bit different from the first two. The third one definitely already here contains something which comes from the four vector. And that might also be the case here. The other two are actually, I mean they depend on the structure of the four vector, but their entries are actually completely independent of the entries of the four vector. Yeah? 
And maybe you could just, in the first entry, there's Px, Py, and Pz. And mm -hmm. where there was the one, it's in the energy, like similar to the third vector. Yeah, so let's try something similar to the third vector. Let's normalize it also by 1 over m, and then let us model it according to the same idea. What would be the same idea? So here you have something proportional to the energy, but of course you have to consider these three as a building block. What is the construction principle of that entire building block? If you compare it to the four vector. Imagine a construction principle which can now be generalized so that we write here some building block of three components, yes? Maybe it's the portion of the energy stored in each direction of momentum. So it would be yeah. And in the other, com so you have x, y, z components here? Yeah, in the first one, it then should be px over... Right, right, right. So in general, let's write it as a three vector. We can write it as p vector. That is what you mean. So what you say, in other words, maybe is that the direction of this is proportional to the direction of p. That's what we have here. So it's oriented in that direction, like that one. And so here also we have three components and the orientation is the same as p vector. But the normalization is different. What is the normalization? That's what you said. Namely, we renormalize uh, such that the energy is actually in the numerator. So each momentum is rescaled by a factor containing the energy. And one rescaling would be this one. E divided by magnitude of p times p vector. And in the special case, that gives this one. Right? And so then you have this. And now the question is, what should we put here? The answer is given by the requirement that p dot epsilon should be zero. Just the magnitude of p. And again, that reproduces this one here as well. Okay. So that works. And so if you check it, you do the scalar product, this times that. And so you need to do the time component product minus the product of the spatial components. If you do that, then you get e times magnitude of p minus p squared divided by magnitude of p times e. That just drops out, so it works. That is a perfect choice for this third vector, and it reproduces this one in the correct special case. And now the other two. And so somehow, if you look at this, they are just constructed by hand. You look at this vector here, and you see, oh, there are two zero components, and therefore just let us by hand choose those uh, two orthogonal vectors which have a zero in the time component. So the construction recipe for those is that they always have a zero in the time component. And then we just uh, put here something which is orthogonal to the momentum, three vector. And therefore, we can only say it in this way, epsilon vector one, epsilon vector two, where epsilon one or two vector uh, are orthogonal to the momentum vector. And let's also normalize them, epsilon vector i times epsilon vector j is equal to Kronecker delta ij. So that means these are simply two uh, normalized unit uh, length one three vectors which happen to be orthogonal to p. And in the special case, this is just a unit vector in x and y direction because the momentum is in z direction. But of course, you can always find two orthogonal three vectors 
which are mutually orthogonal and also normalized and orthogonal to P. And so in this way, you have a basis. And so you see, if you look at only the three part, then you have here um, three dimensions for the three space components, and you have three vectors, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and P. They are all mutually orthogonal. And uh, this, um, these two are automatically orthogonal in four dimensions also to the full P mu for vector because the time component drops out. But in order to make this here into a four vector which is also orthogonal to P mu, you have to put in this specific time component. But anyway, now we have constructed our basis in complete generality for those uh, polarization vectors. And let me just finish with a few statements. So first of all, for all momenta, uh, the necessary condition is fulfilled. We have really epsilon p lambda times p mu equals zero for all lambda. And we also have this epsilon mu p lambda epsilon mu p lambda prime. With this normalization that we have chosen, uh, the same equation is valid again. So we get g lambda lambda prime. So two different ones give minus one. If you take the scalar product with itself, uh, sorry, two different ones give zero, uh, orthogonal in four dimensions, and each one squared gives minus one. Then let us look at what happens under Lorentz transformations. This is quite important for the physics interpretation of our vector field. And therefore, let us finish with this uh, comment on the Lorentz transformations. And a big exercise on the sheet is uh, that you come up with your own further examples uh, illustrating the behavior under Lorentz transformations. And, um, uh, clarifying further what happens here. So consider boosts to or from the rest frame and rotations in the rest frame. So what I want to say is that we do not want to consider here completely arbitrary Lorentz transformations in the completely general case that would be simply too much work. But we have already analyzed and stated in our discussion of the Poincaré group that it's uh, sufficient to consider two things. Namely, either you go into a special reference frame and then you consider the little group transformations, which are all the Lorentz transformations which do not change your momentum in that frame. And then uh, the second thing is that you consider um, specific Lorentz transformations from one frame to another. And so here, uh, specific boosts are all we need to go from the rest frame to any other frame. And in the rest frame, we can consider rotations. And uh, that is the little group in the rest frame. And so studying both will be sufficient to get an understanding of what happens in general. And let us compare two things. On the one hand, let us look at what happens here. So you take one polarization vector according to the definition here, and you act on it with a Lorentz transformation. That looks like a Lorentz transformation of a four vector. But as I said, I would not call this a four vector because a four vector is something that transforms in that way between reference frames. But we have not proven that the epsilons transform like this between reference frames. But let's anyway calculate this and compare it with epsilon mu of lambda p comma lambda. Okay? Yeah. That would be the polarization vector for the Lorentz transformed state. Right? And so this is a different operation because for every momentum we have a recipe to obtain the polarization vectors. And so we can now go 
from one momentum in a, into a different frame, apply again the recipe, and obtain three polarization vectors. <coughs> On the other hand, we can do a Lorentz transformation of the polarization vector. The recipe does not guarantee at all that this has anything to do with that. If it is the same, then we would say this is a four vector or transforms as a four vector, but let us see whether it is the same. And let us see it not in general, but let us see it for those two cases. So let's consider a rotation in the rest frame. In the rest frame, that was our first case A, very simple case. P is just m comma zero. In the rest frame, a rotation does the following lambda on P gives P itself. So P is that specific rest frame vector. Lambda is a rotation and then lambda P just gives P because the rotation doesn't change uh, the zero in the spatial components. Then for this specific case, what happens if we do lambda mu nu epsilon nu of P comma lambda? What happens? So this, I say it again, this is a rotation. So it only changes the spatial components of our vector. And the epsilons for this case are the basis vectors which have ones in the spatial components. So what is the general result of this? How does the four vector look like that comes out of this operation? We know not much about it except for one thing Namely, which of the four entries do we know? So rotation applied on any of those epsilons at the top. That is zero. That's right. And everything else is just something ABC. The point is that whatever this is, we can write it as a linear combination of those same epsilons. So we can write the result definitely as so, uh, let's say maybe a times epsilon mu p comma one plus b times epsilon mu p comma two plus c times epsilon mu p comma three. So what we see is that the Lorentz transformation acting on the polarization vector gives a linear combination of polarization vectors to the appropriate momentum. So, in terms of that, we would say the result of this is a linear combination of all those vectors. It's not equal to any specific one with a specific lambda, but this can be written as a linear combination of all the three with the three different values of lambdas. So the result here is an element of the vector space spanned by those three basis vectors. That is the result. Let's check whether the same result is also true if we consider boosts. Say so boosts uh, from the rest frame. And let us go into the C direction. Boost in, in the C direction. Then let's say a boost in C direction has the following form. The lambda Lorentz transformation matrix has the form cosine hyperbolic eta zero zero sine hyperbolic eta zero zero sine hyperbolic eta cosine hyperbolic eta. That is a boost into the z direction. Okay, and let us look what happens. So do we have enough space? Let me just let me a little bit of space. So let's do the cases. Lambda mu nu times epsilon nu p comma one. What is the result of this operation? Where we are here, we are in the rest frame. That means our epsilons are the ones from the other blackboard, which are just the unit vectors. So that is just the unit vector in x direction. What is the result if you act with this Lorentz transformation onto the unit vector in x direction? Oh, by the way, yeah, say it. <laughs> it stays the same because of the one, <laughs> right? So it stays the same, epsilon mu p comma one. 
with a zero, it wouldn't have stayed the same. Sorry about the misprint. So then lambda mu nu epsilon nu p comma two. What happens here? That is the unit vector in y direction, and we act on it with a boost in z direction. So the same thing happens, right? So it's also it stays the same, epsilon mu p comma two. And now the third case. Lambda mu nu epsilon nu p comma three. That was the unit vector in z direction. And now of course something happens. Namely, what happens? What is the resulting four vector? We apply this matrix onto the unit vector in z direction. So we get sine hyperbolic and cosine hyperbolic here. That means we have here the following result sine hyperbolic eta zero zero cosine hyperbolic eta. On the other hand, on the other hand, the lambda mu nu p nu, our Lorentz transformed four vector, if we go from the rest frame to this Lorentz transformed system, p prime mu, what is the value of this four vector? It uh, is m times cosine hyperbolic eta, zero, zero, m times sine hyperbolic eta, and that is of course the same as the energy in the new reference frame, zero, zero, and pz in the new reference frame. And uh, because of cosine and sine hyperbolic, we satisfies e square minus pz square equal m square, as it has to be. And now you can ask, what is the relationship between uh, the results of our Lorentz transformation applied onto the polarization vectors, here, here, and here, and the polarization vectors corresponding to the transformed four vector? We can now make this comparison here. So what are the polarization vectors for this lambda p? We know it because that was our case b, which is unfortunately deleted, but that was the second case. And uh, you have it still on your note. What was the value of the polarization vectors for exactly this four momentum? The first two were unchanged, so they are those ones here. And the third one was exactly this. The third one was exactly this. Namely, this is now uh, pz divided by m. And that is energy divided by m. That's exactly the value of the third polarization vector. And therefore, we have here in this case, where we consider a boost from the rest frame along the z-axis, we get lambda mu nu epsilon nu of p comma lambda is actually equal to epsilon mu of lambda p comma lambda. So here we have an equality. The lambda stays unchanged and the epsilons really behave like four vectors. In the other case, the epsilons do not behave like four vectors, but uh, the Lorentz transformation results in a linear combination of the uh, appropriate epsilons. And so that is the general case. If you combine both cases, you can reconstruct all possible Lorentz transformations. And therefore, we can now write as a summary. In all cases, we have the following. Lambda mu nu epsilon nu of p comma lambda is a linear combination of the epsilon mu of lambda p comma lambda prime for the three different values of lambda prime. So the individual polarization vectors, they are not four vectors and they do not transform covariantly, but in the sense of a three-dimensional space where these epsilons are just some random basis choice, the three-dimensional space really transforms in a Lorentz covariant way. So 
So we have a covariant transformation of the three-dimensional space spent by the polarization vectors. Okay, this is what I wanted to tell you, and you can now practice this on the exercise sheet with the help of a few more examples and extensions. Good, so thanks, and then let us do the exercise. <laughs>